Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to part one of a two-part conversation, what is relationship between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism? Um, there are, gosh, I guess about 150, 200 people who are watching this live streamed as well as all of you here in the room today. Thank you for attending what promises to be a very interesting conversation. Um, we're all preoccupied by the violence in the Middle East, but what our topic will be focused on today is how uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism are playing out on the university campus. Is anti-Zionism uh, on campus a legitimate protest movement, or is it a form of dangerous hate speech, or somewhere between the two? We understand this is a controversial topic. We understand many of you will disagree with some of the things that you hear today. Disagreement is what university education is all about. Respectful dialogue is a fundamental value of UC Berkeley, and we hope and expect all of you will behave accordingly. Um, I would uh, like to introduce the two speakers. I am Sue Fishkoff. I'm the uh, just retired uh, editor of J, the Jewish News of Northern California. To my immediate right is Professor Ethan Katz. He's faculty director of the Berkeley Center for Jewish Studies and associate professor in the Department of History and the Center for Jewish Studies here at Cal. He's a historian of modern Europe and the Mediterranean with specialties in modern Jewish history and the history of modern France and its empire. Does France still have an empire? All right. He's also chair of the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Jewish Life and Campus Climate and co-director of the Anti-Semitism Education Initiative. On my far right is Professor Dov Waxman from UCLA, where he is the director of the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. He's a professor of political science and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. Professor Waxman's research focuses on the conflict in Israel-Palestine, Israeli politics and foreign policy, U.S.-Israel relations, American Jewry's relationship with Israel, and anti-Semitism. Both of these gentlemen publish widely on their research topics. They speak on those topics widely and they are frequent commentators in the media. So I would uh, like to start out by asking both of you to say a word about the, the broader historical significance of this moment that we find ourselves in, in Israel, in Gaza, and on our college campuses. Um, Professor Katz, if you would speak first. Sure, <laughs> um, thank you so much, Sue, for that kind introduction. Thank you, Dove, for uh, joining us here on campus. Thank you to all of you, uh, both in person and on the live stream, for taking time uh, to, to watch and be part of this. Um, so, yeah, we, we find ourselves in a moment uh, that I think is very dark um, and a moment of extraordinary pain and loss in uh, Israel and Gaza, um, also a very difficult moment in the West Bank, shouldn't be neglected. Um, and a moment where I think it's really important to recognize that both uh, Jewish Zionists, both people attached to Israel and Palestinians are feeling tremendous fear, uh, existential fear in both cases. And I think that that's something we, we can talk a little bit about that perhaps, um, but I think it's very real uh, and just tremendous pain and tremendous loss for people in both communities. Um, I was, shocked and horrified by the events of October 7th. Um, I'm also deeply, deeply um, saddened and, and troubled by what is an unfolding humanitarian disaster in Gaza. And whatever your politics are, I think it's crucial to acknowledge that. So, um, you know, I think we, we need to be real about how severe uh, the violence of events is and how severe the pain and fear and trauma is uh, coming out of that. Um, yeah, well, let me begin, first of all, by thanking you, Sue, and uh, Ethan and the Center for Jewish Studies. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to particularly thank Ethan because uh, 
when I um, suggested that we hold these conversations, uh, he didn't say, are you crazy? Uh, which I was half expecting him to do. Instead, he said, yes, I and mean, that's why we're here. So I want to thank you for, for doing that. But also because I think at the time like this, um, it is essential for us not to shy away from addressing the difficult questions, the questions that are on our minds. And, and um, I think it's really important that we're doing this in, in, in spaces such as this on campus. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to take part in this and I, I'm grateful to you, Ethan, for, for making it possible. Um, you know, I would just echo um, much what Ethan said in terms of the, really, this has just been an excruciatingly difficult uh, time for anyone who cares about uh, the safety of Israel and Israelis and the safety of Palestinians and the Palestinian people. Um, the last nearly four months have really been, I think, um, among the darkest days in, in the entire history of the conflict. I mean, really, no exaggeration. We often use the term historic and it's often overused, but I think we are living through a really a historic period. Um, Israelis, on October the 7th faced, endured the worst, I think the worst single event in the country's history. The worst uh, massacre of Israeli civilians, in fact the highest death toll in, 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 of any single day, and that includes all of Israel's wars. Uh, so it's hard to uh, overstate the magnitude of, of October the 7th and the impact it's going to have and still does have and will have for a long time to come upon Israelis and the trauma that they've experienced as a result of that. And similarly for Palestinians, what's been happening in the Gaza Strip, uh, especially as also in the West Bank, but particularly in Gaza since then, is also the worst event for Palestinians since 1948, since what they call the Nakba, the catastrophe, um, the, the killings, um, have, it, have brought up the very worst memories, the traumatic memories of Palestinians. So um, it, I think for both, in both Israeli and Palestinian history, we are really living through uh, truly uh, historic times and, and, I, and an inflection point in their long conflict. And I can only hope uh, it will turn for the better and not for the worst. Uh, but it's not just historic, uh, in terms of the events in Israel and Palestine, but also I think in terms of what's been taking place in the United States, around the world, and on college campuses. And what we've seen uh, over the last few months are probably uh, the largest pro-Palestinian protests in history. Um, the largest mobilization and support of the Palestinians across college campuses and on the streets of cities around the world. Um, and so um, that is brought to the surface uh, questions and uh, issues that aren't new. They've been, those of us who have worked and focused on this conflict have been discussing some of these issues for a long time. But now these are at the center of national and even global debate. And so I really think in terms of America's uh, an American's understanding of this conflict, how we think about it, um, what we, how we talk about it, we're also uh, in many ways at a historic moment and an inflection point. So I, I really do think we have to, you know, often when you're living through history, you're not always aware that you're living through. But I think we really do have to appreciate the magnitude of the moment, um, but also recognize that people's feelings in this moment are very real, and that's understandable. And as Ethan said, I think first and foremost, we have to keep in mind uh, the victims, the innocent victims on both sides and, and always have that compassion and empathy, whatever our politics. Thank you. Uh, before we get into the discussion of specific topics, how this is all affecting students, faculty, and the university administration, I think it's important um, for each of you to define what you mean by anti-Zionism and the caveat is this is part one of a two-part conversation, as I said. In two weeks at UCLA, the second conversation will take place, is Zionism anti-Semitism? So given that, we still need to define what you mean by anti-Zionism, and has your attitude towards anti-Zionism on campus shifted since October 7th? And let's start with Professor Waxman this time. Okay. Um, 
So, I mean, I'm going to give a definition, but I think there's two ways. We can think about anti-Zionism in terms of there's a definition that some academic is going to provide, right? Um, and I'm happy to do that. But there's also, I think, the ways in which anti-Zionism anti is understood by those who identify as anti-Zionist. Um, and so there's multiple meanings attached, just as there, it's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to pin down a single meaning of what Zionism is, right? Zionism means different things to different people. And so too, anti-Zionism means different things to different people. And I think, you know, one of the one of the kind of discursive battles, if you like, that's taking place today is, is around what the meaning of these terms is. Are we, are, do we think of these terms as having a fixed meaning? Do I, does it something that some academic is gonna say, this is what anti-Zionism is, or do we think of it rather as something that comes up in terms of how people practice? So, you know, for some, in the eyes of some pro-Israel advocacy groups, for example, anti-Zionism is boycotting the settlements, um, you know, or criticizing the occupation. For others, it might be calling for equal rights for the Palestinians. So I think there's lots of different ways of thinking about anti-Zionism. And I think we have to be very uh, attentive to how that how its meaning can differ from person to person. There isn't a single anti-Zionism. There are, just as there are multiple Zionisms in a way, I think there are different forms, different expressions and different kinds of anti-Zionism. So that's my preface by saying what I think of as how I would define it. But again, as I said, my definition is not one necessarily that is shared by people who identify as anti-Zionists. Um, I think, you know, as a belief system or as an ideology, if you like, it is fundamentally the opposition to Israel's existence as a Jewish state in Israel-Palestine, in, in historic Palestine, the land of Israel, whatever you wish to call it, um, and essentially the opposition to that. Now that, but what drives that opposition might be any number of reasons. It might be the belief that um, Israel's existence as a Jewish state is incompatible with Palestinian self-determination or equal rights for Palestinians. It might be the opposition to the practice of Zionism rather than the principle of Zionism. Um, but I, I would say if we had to kind of have a core uh, definition, um, I, would, I would, you know, that would be my minimal definition, opposition to Israel's continued existence as a Jewish state, or to put it differently, opposition to the regime that, specific, that prevails in Israel today, which identifies itself as, as, as a Jewish state. Um, so I think that, I mean, I actually think that the definition is less clear in some ways, um, and it's because we have had extensive debates about the definition of anti-Semitism, debates of which I think Dove and I are both exhausted, um, but we've had very limited real uh, attempt at scholarly definitions of anti-Zionism, and uh, when we read the way the term is invoked by various parties, uh, it can mean profoundly different things. So I actually think we have to talk first for a second about uh, different understandings of Zionism and, and the different uh, understandings of anti-Zionism correlate with those. So I want to just focus on two distinctions for the moment, and, and in part, um, I'm going to echo some of what Dove said here. Uh, so the first distinction is between Zionism as an idea and Zionism as practices on the ground. Right. Zionism as an idea that Jews are entitled to uh, a state or a, an autonomous space for self-determination um, where they can have security and they can have freedom uh, and they can you know, live as a collective in a portion of their historic homeland uh, versus the practices of a Zionist state, a Zionist entity on the ground, what that looks like uh, in reality day to day. Um, those are, I, I think, different understandings for many people, or at least different foci when they talk about Zionism uh, and, and what they identify with most strongly. Um, and meanwhile, the meaning of Zionism for most Jews, uh, certainly uh, since the middle of the last century, is a movement to create uh, this kind of collective entity with security uh, for Jews in a portion of their historic homeland, seen as a national liberation movement of sorts. Right? Whereas for Palestinians, or this is the second distinction I want to make between how it's understood by most Jews and how it's understood by most Palestinians, for most Palestinians, Zionism has been an unceasing project of violence and dispossession, certainly since 1948, if not earlier. Uh, and what Palestinians refer to as the Nakba, or the catastrophe of 1948, is for them the signature event of Zionism, whereas the war for independence, as it's called by Israelis, is the sort of culmination of the first stage of the Zionist project with the establishment of a Zionist entity there. So if you want to think about anti-Zionism and why it's 
has different meanings, you have to think about the corollaries to that. That is, some people just oppose, so go back to the first distinction, some people just oppose the idea that Jews should have a state. There's actually a long history of Jewish politics. It's, it's farther and farther left today. It's still certainly present in groups like JBP. Um, but there, there's a much longer and more complicated and deeper history of Jewish thinkers saying they don't believe in the idea of a Jewish state, that they think of Judaism, they think of Jewishness differently. Then there's opposition to what's going on on the ground, right? For the second piece of that first distinction. So people define their anti-Zionism, they might say, in theory, sure, I'd love for there to be a Jewish state, but I'm so opposed to what Israel's doing on the ground that you know I'm really against Israel's policies. Some might go so far as to say, I'm so opposed to what Israel's doing on the ground that I'm just against Israel's existence, right? Um, if we flip to the other set of distinctions, for people who see Zionism as a national liberation movement for Jews and, and the Israeli state as the fulfillment of that, of course, anti-Zionism is profoundly threatening. Uh, those who call themselves anti-Zionist seem sometimes vocally, sometimes implicitly to be saying, I am against the existence of a Jewish state. I am against the continuing of the state that as a Jew, you see as having you know, lived out a national liberation struggle as having made it possible for Jews to have sovereignty in a portion of their historic homeland. So it's deeply threatening. Flipping it around though, if you are Palestinian or if you are strongly supportive of a certain narrative of Palestinians, you see Zionism simply as having, most importantly, done tremendous violence to Palestinians. And then you would say, how could I not be an anti-Zionist? Because you see it simply as opposing the history and contemporary reality of violence and dispossession against Palestinians. So that's, I mean, those are two sets of distinctions in what Zionism means for many people. And I think the flip is that it gives us a map of the range of meanings for anti-Zionism. I realize I didn't answer the second part of your question. So I'm going to- Do you want to? I will. The second part of my question, <laughs> how have your views on anti-Zionism on campus shifted since October 7th? I think the main shift, I mean, I was certainly you know, are well aware of anti-Zionism on campus. I'm an Israel studies professor, so I'm, I'm obviously aware of that. And I was aware of um, that it was probably on college campuses, including mine, that it's more widespread than elsewhere uh, in, in American society or, or more broadly. I think what surprised me wasn't this expressions of anti-Zionism, because I'm familiar with that, but rather the vehemence, the way in which anti-Zionism for some was, was then understood as an uncritical support for or refusal to condemn Hamas. The, conf the conflation with, of that, that, you know, to oppose Zionism, um, the practice of Zionism, as, as Ethan is saying, um, would somehow mean that you would have to support or condone or refuse to, uh, denounce the mass slaughter of innocent civilians. Um, that surprised me. I thought people would were able to make a distinction between opposing Zionism, which I think is you know entirely legitimate for people to do, and supporting terrorism. Um, and the fact, and so I was surprised that whether it was students or in some cases faculty for whom the anti-Zionism was of such kind of ferocity that they seem to demonstrate, display little if any compassion or empathy for, you know, women, in civilians being murdered in their homes. Um, and that was shocking to me, that, 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 that in their opposition to Zionism, that they seemed to feel that that meant supporting any form of opposition to Zionism, even, in its most, you know, violent and I think, you know, horrific expression or as, as took place in October. So in other words, the kind of the conflation of these two things and the, and the failure to distinguish between supporting the Palestinian cause, which I think uh, is, is le entirely legitimate, and then supporting Hamas is his way of doing that, which I actually think has done great damage to the Palestinian cause. Um. Yeah, so what's, what's changed in my view of anti-Zionism on campus since October 7th? First of all, the, the need to define the term uh, for me really came out uh, much more clearly because while, as Dove said, uh, you know, as someone who uh, works on anti-Semitism on college campuses a lot, anti-Zionism on campuses um, 
which I don't equate with anti-Semitism uh, in a one-to-one -one way, uh, as many of you know. Um, nonetheless, it's a, it's a crucial part of the picture, so it's not, it wasn't new for me, but what was new was to see it so central on our campuses, in discourses, and therefore to realize uh, that we still have a lot of work to do to come to some idea of, of what each of us means by that terminology. Um, I, I think that the, the things, though, that were the most striking to me, in some ways similar to, to Doe, I'm going to say two things that, that may seem contradictory, but I don't think they are. Um, one was that anti-Zionism is not simply at all in this moment the property of Palestinians or Palestinians and Arabs or Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims, people with particular ties to the region. It has come to be taken up as a central, if not the central cause of the moment for a significant segment of the activist left. Right? They have come to identify this, whatever we think of that, as a fundamental civil rights struggle of this moment. Uh, that is striking, uh, and I think it presents a, a number of uh, tremendous challenges uh, for uh, talking productively about uh, this because of the way it's, it's been instrumentalized at times. What is equally striking is that the chants that we hear on college campuses from many pro-Palestinian activists, they must fundamentally mean something different post-October 7th in many cases than they did before. There is no way around that. Um, Jewish students said to me, they said to, to various people who were involved in um, Jewish studies, uh, Jewish life, leadership on this campus, different times in the weeks after October 7th, that there were rallies on our campus where people chanted death to the Jews. I conferred with my colleagues. I said, have you heard that? I haven't heard that. Nobody had heard those words. I came to understand that certain phrases like intifada, intifada, long live the intifada, or when a people is occupied, resistance is justified, chants that were ubiquitous at these rallies, they sounded to Jewish students like people were calling for murder of Jews. Now, we can talk about the origins of these slogans. We can talk about their literal translation. It is important to recognize they mean different things to different people. I am not sitting here and claiming that the way they landed with some Jewish students is the only way that can be understood. Let me be very clear about that. But we do understand that after this horrific set of acts on October 7th that were done in the name of resistance and that were defended, as Dove has referred to, by many people who are anti-Zionist in the name of anti-Zionist resistance, that a slogan like when a people is occupied, resistance is justified days after October 7th sounds like a defense of the murder of hundreds of Jewish Israeli civilians, right? When a, a slogan, Intifada, Intifada, which already resonates for many people with the violence of the second Intifada, it sounds like a call for continuation of violence. And it sounds scary, frankly, when it's accompanied by uh, rhetoric from certain campus organizations about spreading or globalizing the Intifada. So I think for me, I came to be much more concerned about the way these slogans land uh, than I was before, even though I was conscious of the fact they had different meanings. Uh, but I think uh, I came to see that their meanings had changed uh, and that I think we need to be attentive to that, uh, just as we are for, for the way other kinds of rhetoric lands uh, with historically uh, other historically marginalized groups. Thank you both for giving this discussion more of a, a historic context and a political context. You've both suggested, said, that what has happened in the last four months on campus is a hardening of, of positions, a loss of nuance, if you will. It's difficult, if not impossible, to maintain nuance when there's a hot war, right, in the middle of a hot war, and the importance of perspective, not just what people say, what those words mean, but how they are understood by people who feel themselves under siege. Um, so let's move to some of the specific topics uh, on campus today and start with the rallies. I don't want to use the words pro-Israel rallies and pro-Palestinian rallies, um, but let's talk about uh, rallies demanding an end to the uh, war in Gaza and rallies in support of Israel and return of the hostages. Uh, 
how do you understand these rallies and does the location of a particular rally or a protest matter? And Professor Katz, let's start with you on this one. Um, sure, yeah, so I, I've said a little bit about uh, the way that I think um, some of the language at the rallies has to at least be, um, there has to at least be a sensitivity around some of that language. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to say a call for the return of hostages does not need to be understood as supportive of Israel's actions in this war in any way, okay? Um, hostages being taken is a war crime. Um, the return of hostages in international situations is a humanitarian consideration. And in fact, students have made choices to focus on that issue in rallies, in part to try to focus on things that can unify everyone, to try not to be divisive. And the decision that some, many have made to tear down posters with pictures of hostages, to object to calls for the return of hostages as if those people were chanting you know, on behalf of the Israeli Defense Forces in Gaza is a, is a tragedy in terms of what it represents for our loss of capacity to humanize each other. By the same token, rallies in favor of a ceasefire are not anti-Semitic rallies. Okay, and people who said that calling for ceasefire in the days after October 7th was anti-Semitic, I, I think is a completely unsustainable claim. I understand at, at a rational level both of these claims. I understand why people were upset by calls of ceasefire in that it seemed to strip the Israeli state of the right to defend itself. I think the Israeli state has the right to defend itself like any other state. I think this is an attack that warrants uh, defensive action. We can have enormous debates about what that should look like. So I, I get the, the instinct. But the fact is, many people are simply very worried about violence in Gaza. They have much more reason to be upset about violence in Gaza four months later. Uh, and calling for a ceasefire there is a call for an end to that violence. Um, you know, we, we would do better in all of our conversations on campus right now to try to start by assuming we might have something in common with the speaker rather than assuming uh, that they hold an opposing view that we find uh, repugnant. But I, I fear we're often starting from the latter position, and these are just two examples. Yeah, I, um, you know, I agree with, with the points Ethan made. I would just add a few. I think, first of all, my reaction to, I think the ra rally that took place on, say, October the 8th, Right, that rallies that were staged by some SJP Students for Justice in Palestine chapters, where they were, you know, saying you know, all resistance is justified, and and, they were, and the national uh, organization of SJP produced posters with the hang glider, which you know uh, Hamas militants had used to arrive at this field where the, the Nova Music Festival rave was taking place and then proceeded to slaughter over, you know, two, 300 young people. That, my reaction to that is different than my reaction to the subsequent rallies. And unfortunately, in, the, in a lot of the media, these things are all being conflated. They're all pro-Hamas rallies. Um, I think it's reasonable to see the rally on October the 7th before the war in Gaza really got underway as you know, the, some, as expression. Now, I don't necessarily think that's necessarily anti-Semitic. I think it's reprehensible, morally, uh, I think, uh, deeply flawed that people would, you know, um, rally and, and praise and celebrate what Hamas did on October the 7th. Um, you know, and it, at the minimum, it, it conveys a kind of moral failure, in my opinion. Um, and so my reaction to that is different than the rallies and the protests that have been taking place since then, since the war in Gaza got underway as Palestinian civilian deaths have mounted. And I think it, uh, those, as I understand it, you know, obviously a rally brings together people with all sorts of uh, you know, ideas, beliefs, motivations. So it's very hard to kind of generalize, but I think from, you know, the least uh, the rallies that have taken place on, on many college campuses, I think have generally been uh, more than anything and exp uh, motivated by a genuine, uh, understandable expression of concern for the suffering of Palestinian civilians under Israeli bombardment and the demand, as Ethan said, for, for a ceasefire. 
And I think to describe those protesters as, you know, pro-Hamas is, is uh, in many cases, probably in most vast majority of cases, false. Um, and to describe them uh, or to label them all in totality as anti-Semitic is not only false, but dangerously false. And I'm here um, specifically referring to a uh, recent uh, regrettable decision, in my, in my opinion, by the Anti-Defamation League to include every one of those rallies in its tallying of anti-Semitic incidents over the last few months, which has included all of those rallies. Now, as I say, I, I, I certainly accept, recognize that in some rallies, there may well be anti-Semitic slogans used, and I don't think free Palestine, we all get it, we can talk about that, but there may be anti-Semitic slogans. There certainly may be anti-Semitic signs. Um, and, you know, the equation, I think it is, uh, for example, the, uh, you know, a swastika uh, used in that context and equating Israel with Nazi Germany. Uh, I do think is anti-Semitic. So there may be anti-Semitic discourse. There may be pe people at the rally who may make anti-Semitic statements, but to, to dis characterize an entire rally as anti-Semitic, um, I think, as I say, it's not only, it's not only wrong, but it, it actually, uh, where the, it's actually dangerous because there is actually a problem of anti-Semitism, right? And we have seen anti-Semitism surge over the last few months. And we have seen anti-Semitism un, in the guise of anti-Zionism. And we have seen Jews being assaulted and attacked and harassed. So there really is an issue here. And, and we need to really understand that. But to, we, our ability to, to understand this issue and respond to it is not helped by conflating all expressions of support for the Palestinians or opposition to Israel's actions in Gaza as anti-Semitic. That only actually um, confuses matters. It means that we don't really understand the nature of the problem. We, we might think there's much more uh, anti-Semitism or more anti-Semitic incidents because we're counting every rally taking place on a college campus. And it also leaves, allow, uh, lets people, it also, um, opens up the charge of anti-Semitism to people saying, oh, well, you're just trying to silence or repress, mm -hmm. you know, a legitimate political protest. And that means that when actual anti-Semitic incidents do happen, and Jewish students in particular do encounter anti-Semitism, sometimes their claims or their, their complaints aren't taken seriously. They're dismissed because others will say, well, we can see, look, people are talking about any form of pro-Palestinian activism or anti-Zionism as anti-Semitic. So by, by not using, by misusing it, we're actually making campuses less safe for Jewish students, because it means that legitimate, well-founded charges and complaints of anti-Semitism aren't being taken seriously or being dismissed, and it, it cheapens the term. So I think we need to be able to say, you know, if there's a particular rally that's taking place and there are signs or statements made, or for example, if after the rally, some demonstrators then go on to, you know, bully or harass or intimidate some Jewish student walking by, we need to be able to call that out as anti-Semitic. But, but to, to describe the entire rally in its totality as anti-Semitic, I think is, is, is really problematic. And I think, uh, unfortunately, you know, I understand at the moment there's a propaganda war being waged. There's a war actually being waged, mm -hmm. and there's also a propaganda war that's being waged mm -hmm. by, by partisans on both sides. And, in, and in, the, in the service of that propaganda war, it serves, uh, you know, unfortunately, it can serve the kind of pro-Israel side to depict all opposition to Israel's actions in Gaza, all opposition to the war, as pro-Hamas and as anti-Semitic. Um, so I understand what kind of what's driving that, but I do think we have to not, um, you know, just fall, be, be um, susceptible to that uh, propaganda and be able to make these distinctions and to say, this is, that, this is where it crossed the line. This is where this became anti-Semitic. Um, and I think, unfortunately, um, people haven't done that. And I, that doesn't mean to say that I, I'm not, attentive to the ways in which these rallies and demonstrations can impact some Jewish students on campus. First of all, it's important to recognize that some Jewish students are in those rallies, right? So uh, it's not always a question of like, Jewish students are threatened by the, the Jewish students, 
but also take part in those rallies. I think often when the discussion kind of assumes that Jewish students are a monolithic block and they perceive these things a single way, and that's not the case. Um, but I, I do think, obviously, for some Jewish students, they, these demonstrations and rallies can be experienced as, as, uh, as frightening and scary. Um, but, I, but I think we should be careful about assuming that because something is perceived to be maybe threatening, that that makes it anti-Semitic, right? We need to be able to say, yes, we need to be attentive. And if it does end up becoming a question of like her, uh, actual harassment or violence. Um, but what we've seen over the last few months, I'm thinking of what happened at say, Cooper Union in New York, you know, where an incident where it wasn't at the rally, but afterwards, and it got blown up into an incident where Jewish students were depicted as being terrorized by pro-Palestinian demonstrators. These incidents are often, few, uh, uh, I think, uh, seized upon, sometimes deliberately exaggerated and missed, uh, kind of misrepresented by external groups for their own purposes. And I think we have to be very wary about kind of falling into that narrative that every rally is somehow a threat that has to be squashed. So, yeah, um, I agree with much of what Dove said, but I do want to add uh, a few other points. Um, so first of all, I, I just want to say that I think the corollary to the point you um, made uh, very effectively at, at length there about pro-Palestinian rallies is also true for rallies that have been held by Jewish students who feel attached to Israel in different ways. Those rallies should not be equated with anti-Palestinian sentiment. They should not be equated with uh, approval for all the actions of the Israeli government or all the actions of the IDF. You know, Jewish students, uh, I, I think, were particularly in the days and the weeks after October 7th, they were in many cases desperate to gather to feel a sense of solidarity in the face of an, a genuine trauma uh, and to stand with hostages and to stand with people who were in mourning. Many of them were personally in mourning. If they were not personally in mourning, they almost invariably knew people or were close to people who were personally in mourning. Um, and so those rallies were not, and, and they, in many cases, they were singing songs of peace. They were trying very hard to articulate that, that they knew that Hamas did not represent all Palestinians. Uh, and yet, those rallies have been branded very often as anti-Palestinian rallies, uh, racist rallies, uh, rallies in support of Israel's war in Gaza. Um, and so I think that that has only heightened the sense for Jewish students of tremendous isolation. I think the point about not assuming loyalty on the part of anybody is really important. Uh, I think many Jewish students on our campuses, in part because the discourse is so polarized, they find themselves in an incredibly difficult spot right now. They feel tremendous uh, ties to Israel in different ways. They feel tremendous loss about what happened on October 7th. And they are also often feeling very critical about the actions of Israel's government right now. And they don't have any political home oftentimes because the discourse is so polarized. That leads me to the second point uh, that I just want to underscore, which is, I, I think you're right, Dove, that um, those rallies, by and large, should not be depicted as anti-Semitic, uh, you know, um, full stop. But I do think that one of the defining experiences of this moment for many Jews on and off of campuses is an experience of erasure, an experience of feeling that the Jewish perspectives on what happened on October 7th and what happened next were completely irrelevant. They were completely obliterated. To hold these rallies, even in the weeks after October 7th, that were so ardently pro-Palestinian, taking up these slogans, not expressing a word of concern about this massacre of Israeli civilians, was deeply, deeply alienating for Jews. There's no way around it, and it's, it's just human. It's not because Jews don't want to hear Palestinian perspectives, or they can't hear Palestinian perspectives, or they don't think Palestinians are real people. Some of the accusations that have been thrown uh, at, at Jews for objecting to the tenor of these rallies, it's because Jews and Israelis are in mourning, and they are shocked that their experience of tremendous loss is just completely being denied or ignored by many people talking about the conflict. Of course, it goes the other way also, and, and we know that, and, and I, I'm not endorsing uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm not uh, saying that, that there isn't a problem of dehumanization uh, in the way that uh, Palestinian lives in Gaza are being talked about uh, at times as well. That, that's also equally significant. Um, but in terms of thinking about these specific rallies, I think it's important to realize that that's one of the reasons that they have evoked tremendous pain for people uh, is because they have felt at the end of the day, profoundly you know, dehumanizing and in a sense, erasive of Israeli and Jewish perspectives. Yeah, can I just add to that? Sure. I, I, I think, I, I, I agree that, that there is that feeling and, and I mean, I think many Jewish people and even including myself have felt that. Um, but, I, but I also think, you know, we, uh, the, and I understand why the, that, that in experiencing that, in feeling that, in feeling that there, there was, there's very, there's been little recognition or, or, or really attention to that grief uh, that, that many, many Jews, most Jews uh, have felt in the, in shock in the aftermath of October the 7th. The explanation for that is that many people have seized upon it is, well, it's because of anti-Semitism. And I think that's where, and in some cases it might be, in some cases it might genuinely be that yes. Jewish lives matter less. But it might also be in many cases, and I think many of the student protests, the fact that immediately following this terrible, terrible tragedy and event was a massive war. And so people's attention, so in, in part it was the fact that as soon as we didn't have time, people didn't have time to process or respond. I think many people were probably truly were outraged and saddened and shocked by what took place on October 7th. But within days, a massive war began and that was people's attention. And then people were thinking about, well, now. So it wasn't that they were necessarily uh, uh, ignoring the, I mean, in, in the end, what they were focusing on in is the people who are being currently killed. Um, so I'm not sure if it was always, in some cases, as I said, it, there may be anti-Semitic. And I totally understand, because I think there's already a narrative, which I understand where, where some of that comes from, that, um, that is being promoted that says Jews are being erased, Jewish victimhood, and, um, and it's, you know, whether it's in anti-racist uh, education, whether it's in DEI programs, whether it's the kind of recognition of anti-Semitism as a type of racism that Jews... So there's already this pre-existing sense that what Jews experience, anti-Semitism, is not always acknowledged and accepted. And into that already pre-existing feeling of being ignored or erased, you have the re reactions to uh, what to the war. And I think that, what I, so what I want to say is, I'm not saying that's totally wrong, although I think it's oversimplified, um, but I think the conjunction of these two events, had there been not an immediate uh, you know, war, then maybe people would have been able to have expressed more. Uh, but I think immediately, unfortunately, people's attention, and, and most people, sadly, or at least the media, don't seem to have the capacity to respond to both these things, right? You know, the media completely shifts. And, it, and so attention immediately <laughs> shifted to, uh, and I think actually, you know, had in fact, you know, we're not going to get into the 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 the, the war itself. Mm -hmm. But actually, I think the that was in a sense a mistake that they sh that the Israel could have used that moment to say, look at what's happened when there may have been an outpouring of real revulsion against Hamas. Yeah. But instead, it went it quickly shifted the narrative to the position of Israel attacking you know Palestinians in Gaza. We're going to talk up here for about another ten minutes and then take questions from the audience. Um, and I want to turn the conversation now um, to a sharp focus on campus university administrations, how they're reacting, how students are reacting. Positions have hardened, right? The discourse has been polarized, as both of these gentlemen said. A major victim of this polarization is the free exchange of ideas. And that is what is demanded of a university education. When you close the doors to those who disagree with you, you, you hurt that central mission of a university, do you not? So I want, to I want to turn to some of the actions that have been taken by universities and get your um, opinions on them. We have universities like Columbia and Brandeis who have uh, one banned and one suspended Students for Justice in Palestine um, for alleged rule violations at those universities. And we have, on the other hand, student groups here at Cal in the law school 
who have banned Zionist speakers, or in some cases made clear that even Zionist students are not welcome in their organizations. So um, I'd like your reactions to both of those specific issues, and what is the responsibility of the university administration in general towards its students? Um, would, whoever would like to start first. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I mean, let's talk for a second about the SJP bans. I, I mean, first of all, I think it's important to just say at the outset, Neither one of us is an administrator of Brandeis or Columbia, and we have not actually seen the full, uh, you know, claims about rule violations. I actually have little doubt that those clubs have violated some rules, okay? Um, but on the other hand, a lot of student organizations violate rules with some regularity. Um, so, you know, I, I think by and large, we need more speech, not less, and we need a very, very capacious uh, public forum for all kinds of speech and all kinds of debate. I do just want to note, however, the SJP nationally produced a toolkit in the days after October 7th that used extremely violent language and talked about continuing the intifada in the diaspora and said that continuing the intifada does not mean being a bystander. It means being an activist. That was alarming to many Jewish students. I had many Jewish students who came to me and said, this sounds like a threat to me. Right? So the choice to use that kind of language uh, and also to use language there and elsewhere that sounded like it was an endorsement of Hamas, a widely recognized terror organization. I realize it's other things also, but it certainly is that and it just carried out one of its greatest, uh, most horrific terrorist acts ever. Um, I mean, those are choices that an organization makes and that put the organization in the crosshairs much more. And I think it's important for organizations to own the choices that they make um, and for universities that have, for instance, rules about endorsing terrorist organizations or things like that, then SJP being banned, whether we agree with that rule, seems to me uh, well within uh, the rules. The reality is private universities like Columbia and Brandeis have much more uh, capacity legally to police speech than a public university like this one does. Um, so I, I, in general, I don't think that speech should be being shut down in this debate. It should be very wide and capacious, but I also think it's important to recognize when, when speech is, is going in, in a direction that people can find genuinely threatening. As far as the law school uh, bans uh, that took place of um, nine, and I think eventually uh, more than 20 clubs uh, last year, uh, bans, that, bans on Zionist speakers, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, in many ways, these are the flips of each other, right? Uh, that the, the idea that you're going to uh, ban anybody, and they're pretty clear in the language they use, not just from talking about Zionism, but from talking about torts, from talking about abortion, from talking about any legal issue because of the fact that they uh, have some support for the existence of a Jewish state in Israel um, is extraordinarily problematic. I I'm persuaded by those I'm not a lawyer. I'm persuaded by those who said that legally it could be done because it's a political ideology, um, but it, it was extremely exclusionary. And I don't think those clubs ever explicitly banned Jewish students, but they sent a very clear message, which was articulated over and over again by Jewish students, that they had to choose. Either they just put away any attachment to Zionism, or they quietly dissociate from those clubs. Uh, and this included a lot of clubs like Women of Berkeley Law, for instance, that have no prior connection to the Middle East uh, or to this conflict. So it, it was extremely, um, you know, it was, a, it was an extremely painful episode for uh, numerous law students. And, and I think um, while it, it may be allowed, uh, I, I think it's absolutely the wrong way to try to express solidarity uh, with one side or the other to, to shut down speech uh, from the other side. So I'm aware that I'm talking here the home of the free speech movement um, at Berkeley, which I think is uh, 60 years ago it began. Um, and I think we're, I'm talking here at a moment where um, I think is a real serious threat to free speech on campus. And for, and, you know, for various reasons, forces, uh, uh, groups are, are kind of using this uh, moment and the understandable anxiety that many people feel about what's taken place to um, potentially uh, restrict the ability, particularly of uh, pro-Palestinian students, um, particularly, and that particularly affects 
uh, Palestinian students, Muslim students, other students, to campaign for and advocate on behalf of Palestinian rights. So I think when it comes to the SJP, on the one hand, yes, I was, as I, as I said earlier, I was really appalled by their um, kind of apparent, you know, uh, con con condoning and even celebrating of October the 7th. So I, I, I actually absolutely think uh, SJP's um, statements and you know and some of their activities should be called out and condemned and I don't think that I, as a, I don't think there's anything wrong in doing that when they uh, violate university rules then I think you know they should be held to account as any student group should be held to a ground if they, and it should be consistent, not selective punishment. So if, if, if it's applied across the board and it's not like singling out of pro-Palestinian students and specifically targeting Palestinian activism, then, you know, I'd I actually completely agree with that, that of course universities have to uphold their rules. Um, and so I would make a big distinction between say Columbia, which suspended SJP for apparently violating Colombia's rules, and Brandeis, which banned SJP. One is in upholding the rules of a university and the rules of a community, which I think is important. And as I said, as long as it's applied equally and without discrimination, then I totally support that. Um, you know, but uh, I don't support, and I think uh, on the grounds of free speech and freedom of association, a ban on SJP. Um, nor do I support, you know, the talk about this Florida, um, which I don't think they're actually gonna do it. I mean, the claim that SJP provided material support, which is the grounds that, you know, Ron DeSantis was using to try and get SJP completely banned. You know, I think that's, I, I, maybe there's evidence, but I haven't heard, seen any real evidence. That kit, rep reprehensible though it was, in my opinion, it does not amount to material support for terrorism. Um, and so I think, you know, SJP chapters have a, a right to exist on college campuses if <laughs> students want to form those chapters and want to participate in. Like other student clubs, they should take, they should follow the rules. But I don't think it's right to ban those clubs. Um, so that's on the SJP, on the, on the banning of Zionist students, um, or so, sorry, Zionist speakers. Yeah, I mean, I'm aware that this has happened here at Berkeley, um, so I'm a bit reticent about weighing in on this, but my reaction was, I think it's very difficult. On the one hand, I totally understand and empathize with the feelings that many Jewish law school students may have felt that, you know, we are being excluded from, effectively excluded from these clubs that have announced their opposition to Zionist speakers. And for us, that amounts to kind of exclusion and 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 at the very least that doesn't create a kind of inclusive community. So I think it's, I, I would, I, on a personal level, criticize those bans because they go against the engagement. So I think, you know, have a Zionist speaker in there and challenge them if you want, ask questions. That, that's what we should be doing is engaging and, and debating, not, you know, imposing bans in, in general. But that said, I do understand that those student groups had the right to do that because they have a right to decide who, is, who they're gonna to invite to speak. They have a right, they also have a right to decide who's gonna be their members. So, you know, Hillel, national Hillel, doesn't allow speakers who support BDS, right? That's their right. And so I think on the one hand, groups have that right. We, I may disagree with it, I may think it's a bad idea to do, but I, I don't think it's a, uh, you know, a kind of illegal or necessarily anti-Semitic. As I understood it, you know, what these groups are trying to do uh, is make Zionism uh, kind of unacceptable in these places, like force students to disassociate. And I understand that for, you know, people and particularly many Jewish students who identify as Zionists, that's really uncomfortable because for most, many Jews who identify as Zionists, Zionism is experienced not as a political ideology or identity, right? Not, but rather as a kind of, you know, an aspect, a, core, a feature of their Jewishness, a way in which they understand their Jewish identity and, and, and is central to that. So it's experienced for many as anti-Semitic, it's experienced as an attack upon their own sense of who they are and their identity. But for many of the activists imposing these kinds of bans, Zionism is an ideology that is responsible for what they believe Israel's doing to Palestinians in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, et cetera. And, and so 
um, they have a right to protest that. And they have a right to say, you know, we, that's not acceptable. And in many ways, that was really about uh, underlying that, although I don't think it always came up, was about the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement and anti normalization. Right. And so, yes. although it was framed in terms of, you know, should do it, you know, inclusion of students, it's really about, you know, <coughs> the, 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 the idea that there is going to be no engagement with anti normalization. And, and I personally disagree with that, and I, particularly on a college campus, and I think in general, but that, but it's, in other words, there is, on the one hand, the right of students to engage in BDS, right? Even if I disagree with it, they have the right to do that. And that has to be, at the same time, there's the right of every student to be for an education. There's tension between these things. Um, and I think, you know, we have to recognize that tension and, and I think um, in, this, in, the inst in this instance, um, it is defensible, not because I agree with the action, but they weren't, as far as I understand, banning Jewish students or even Zionist students. They were just saying speakers. And so in a sense that I think, and the other thing is whether it would be anti-Semitic or not depends upon if they apply that ban only to Jewish speakers. So if Jewish, potential Jewish speakers have to disown their Zionism or say they're not Zionist to be invited and not non-Jewish speakers, then it would be anti semitic because it would be discriminatory. So the question is, how is that ban actually enforced? Uh, if, it is in, if it is only made to apply to Jewish speakers who have to disassociate themselves from Zionism, then it's discriminatory against Jews. If it's, if it's in anybody, then it's not, it's anti-Zionist, I think it's wrong on, as a political strategy, but it's not anti-Semitic. Thank you both. We've covered a lot of topics. The, it, the issue is very complicated. It's emotional as well as political. I'd like to turn to questions now. I'm gonna take a few questions from the audience. Um, we'll turn on the chat function on the live stream uh, yeah, so there will be, then we'll take some questions from the online audience. And I would like to privilege students, people who look like students to me. <laughs> so please be honest there. Student? Yes. Uh, wait for the mic so that people online can hear you. Thank you very much. That's a, thank you both um, very, very much for doing this talk uh, and for delivering such a nuanced, kind of and thorough investigation of um, what I think has been a, well, the word that gets thrown around is, is kind of car crash uh, <laughs> the last few months. I arrived, I arrived here from the UK in, in August um, and kind of, it was, it's been, a, it's been intense. Um, you, the, the, the question that, 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 that frames your talk is, is, is anti-Zionism anti-Semitism? And that's the, that has been the, central question of Jewish politics for the entirety of my adult life, long, long, long before October the 7th. Um, it's a central preoccupation of the ADL. It's the central preoccupation of JVP, which has been around for much more time than, you know, the, the last few months. Um, and it definitely makes sense that there's a, a more moderate and a, and a liberal and thorough engagement with the question. But I, I do think that it's something that's been debated for a long time. It makes sense that the kind of the wreckage this, of this car crash is being investigated with this crash. And I think what fills me with dread is that when I finish this PhD in seven years time, the conversation of the question of is anti-Zionism anti-Semitism, the conversation won't have moved on and will be, will still be here. So my question, my question is twofold. How do we move on? And whose responsibility is it to move the conversation on? Okay. Uh, do you want, shall I take it? You start. <laughs> yeah, first of all, I agree with you. I think this is, not, this is a perennial question. Um, it's, it's certainly not a new question, but I think it is, it, it's, 
the intensity around it, the salience of the question, I think, is new, is increased. Because before, this was a question that, you know, intellectuals, academics may have debated in seminar rooms and discussed. You know, there was some discussion. This is now a question that is now, you know, come up on, on recently in Congress. I mean, the House of Representatives basically just passed a bill saying anti-Zionism is anti -Zionism. So this has gone from a kind of intellectual discussion to, um, you know, something that's really at, coming at the center of our national conversation and politics. Um, so I think one thing I would say is politicians should not be the ones doing this because we're, we're seeing that, you know, that was, um, I mean, just the, the kind of, uh, totally um, exploiting r serious concerns about um, anti-Semitic anti-Zionism and turning it into a kind of political instrument to, to use it as a way to embarrass some Democrats and, and to make political capital out of it. Um, and that doesn't, and as I say, I think that's really harmful. It's, it's, it's just making this issue extremely politicized. So, you know, my general, and I'll be saying much more about this in a couple of weeks, um, when, we, when we address the question of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, I generally say we have to reframe the question. It's not, is anti-Zionism anti-Semitic? It's when <coughs> is anti-Zionism anti-Semitic? And we need to therefore be able to educate people and explain when anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic and when it isn't. And we need to be, and ideally we can point to, you know, examples and we can say, here's a good example. And so, you know, but we, in order to do it, we also need to actually educate people about what anti-Semitism is. I mean, that's that the most people actually don't really have a much of a, a grasp of what, what makes something anti-Semitic. And, you know, so, so I think there's a huge amount of public education that needs to be done so we can actually have a much more, uh, a much better, more sophisticated, more nuanced conversation. I applaud, you know, Berkeley for having an anti-Semitism education initiative, um, recognizing the need for, do, for doing that. And so I, I you know, I think, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I'm here and talking about this and I think it's so important is because I think it is essential for uh, academics and, ex and, you know, to address this and not leave it to simply politicians who are doing it, you know, I mean, um, politicians who on the one hand will say nothing about white nationalism, okay, or, or the vilification of George Soros, or even engage in or uh, echoing replacement theory, which has led to mass murder of Jews, um, and yet now grandstand about anti-Zionism. So, Clearly, I don't think we should leave it to politicians. I also don't think we should just leave it to advocacy groups, whether we agree with their agenda or not, because obviously they have an agenda. Um, and so that, that I, I think it does uh, mean it, it's, it's very important for those of us who are not, you know, uh, having come some sort of political um, uh, motive or, or, um, or trying to fundraise to actually address these things. And I'm hopeful well, sometimes I'm hopeful <laughs> that um, now that we're, ha that we're ha that having conversations like this can gradually move the ball forward because it's recognizing that, you know, what was once maybe a, an issue of, you know, marginal concern to, you know, students and academics is now we're, we're now realizing that anti-Semitism is, anti-Zionism is growing in the United States. And, and I think that it will continue to. And therefore we need to be able to ha have serious discussions and we need to be able to tell people here you know it is here's when it can become anti-semitic here's when it isn't and not simply conflate the two because that is going to not only that is just going to fuel the polarization and as i said ultimately make it harder to counter anti-semitic anti-zionism when it occurs because it will just cheapen charges of anti-semitism anti altogether so i'm hopeful but it's a long road ahead um, but I think it's in places, it's times like this and in places like this that it, we should be doing that education. Um, I'll just uh, say a few things briefly. I mean, I, I much agree with what uh, Dove said. The thing is, for reasons we've already said here, for many Jews, especially in the post-October 7th moment, anti-Zionism is perceived as an existential threat. Simultaneously, for many Palestinians, the need to oppose Zionism with some form of anti-Zionism feels existential, right? Those truths and the simultaneity of those truths is something that most people on the two sides only know their own side of. 
And if we want to move on, that basic understanding being very widespread is at a basic level what we need. We need Jews to be able to articulate why for so many Zionism is fundamental and is not about hostility to Palestinians and can be compatible with various forms of Palestinian liberation. We need Palestinians to be able to articulate why Zionism fundamentally has meant for them violence and dispossession, and therefore anti-Zionism feels existentially important to them in some form. If we could activate that conversation, and it can only happen, in my opinion, bit by bit, you know, in some ways, coffee table by coffee table, uh, you know, campus by campus, uh, then I think we could actually really move to a different uh, focus. Um, but I think that is substantially the responsibility of educators. Right. University campuses are unique places. One of the tragedies of what's happening right now is that there is so little education and there's so much polemic. We somehow think that anti-Zionists and Zionists, because they are literally at war in the Middle East, must be at war on our campuses. There's nothing automatic about that. There's nothing that says that those of us who have particular attachments to Israel or to Palestine must be at war on our campuses. Uh, instead, we actually must find ways to learn from each other and listen to each other. So I think that it is really the responsibility of educators uh, to figure out more complex yet clear and pithy ways to talk about anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism so that, yes, when you finish your PhD, Leo, God willing, we are not still having this conversation. <laughs> and um, I'd like to move to this side of the room. I might suggest that it's a good thing if we are still having this conversation in seven years, because maybe it's a conversation that should not be settled, but continue to um, be discussed and let the disagreements flourish. Uh, for 30 years. <laughs> 30, <laughs> 30. Thank you very much, profound talk. Speaking as a student, I can tell you that a lot of people that are familiar with the political situation with Israel and Palestine desire a ceasefire to stop the violence and to ensure that there's peace in the region. And I just did the research real briefly and I found that this is part of a larger trend where voters support a ceasefire. 60% of US voters currently support a ceasefire in the region, but only 11% of lawmakers in the US Congress support a ceasefire. So, I mean, I guess I was just curious, like, why do you think a ceasefire is currently so unpopular in political circles? As university professors, can we bring that, that question somehow right. back to campus and how it's informing the campus climate? I mean, I, I think that it's, I think it's very much read through the polarities that we're describing here. Um, I think that it very quick, that calls for a ceasefire um, became identified very quickly with opposition to uh, Israel defending itself after the attack of October 7th. And once that happened, and it happened partly by design on the part of certain people who wanted to advocate for a military response, um, once that happened, then supporting a ceasefire became equated, sometimes actively, sometimes implicitly, with saying that Israel doesn't have a right to continue its military campaign, doesn't have a right to defend itself, right? That was, the, that was the way that it became equated rhetorically. I'm not saying that equation is accurate, okay? Um, so in a context where, despite many animated disagreements, uh, we still have overwhelming congressional support for fundamental support for the state of Israel and part of the U.S. government, and we look at the votes, uh, we, we see very few uh, members of Congress who vote against uh, various measures of support for Israel. In that context, uh, I think that people find it very hard to stand up for a ceasefire. There are undoubtedly members of Congress who would like to give a very nuanced speech about how they believe in Israel's right to defend itself, they think there should be a ceasefire soon, they're not sure that they know everything about what's going on in Gaza, but that's a hard speech to give and will win you plaudits from almost no one. Uh, so I think in the way that that discussion became rapidly so polarized and much of the American Jewish establishment identified with an Israeli discourse that said calling for a ceasefire is impinging Israel's right to defend itself, um, the nuance of that was lost rapidly. Yeah, I agree. I think it, 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 it has become in some ways victim to that kind of polarization where it's seen as a pro-Palestinian position, anti-Israel position, and the, the politics of that. 
Um, I think obviously it's a different thing for people, you know, general members of the public to kind of be pro ceasefire, which they might mean all sorts of different things by that, right? We don't really have like a, a nice slogan, <laughs> but, but they have very different understandings of what that might mean in practice and a policymaker to actually call for it, but where they do generally, well, they should at least have a, a more, you know, thought out understanding of what that would mean. So I think it's not, it, it, you know, it, it's, there's a difference between somebody just saying it in an opinion poll and somebody, uh, 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 you know, a legislator calling for it. Um, but I, but I think, and it is unfortunate that it has become like a totemic thing, like you know, ceasefire, not ceasefire, as opposed to having a conversation like there's a whole host of issues that we need to address, and instead it's become like, do you mouth this word or not, uh, which is un which is unfortunate. I think one other thing I'd say, and, and this is slightly outside of the bounds of our discussion, but there is there is definitely a discrepancy between the ways in which the Israel-Palestine issue is discussed and, or not discussed on Capitol Hill, and the shifts that's taking place in, Amer in, in on the grassroots level in, in the American yeah. public. And there's a lag, there's a, you know, um, certainly, and we're seeing that shift, we're seeing a shift taking place, but the, I think the, the shift that's taken place on the, on, the, on the grassroots level, and certainly among younger, young people, is not yet, being reflected in the corridors of power in, in, in DC on Capitol Hill. Um, and so that there's also, there's that gap between public sentiment and particularly progressives and young people and Democrats and actually what's taking place. And then, you know, it's not only when it comes to Israel, Palestine is on other issues as well. We've seen that, I mean, most famously in recent years was immigration where public opinion on the right became much more anti uh, immigration, and then eventually somebody like Donald Trump came along and took advantage of that. Um, but so there's sometimes it, there is a kind of lag uh, for elites to respond to, you know, shifts in public opinion. Let's turn to our online audience, if we could. Um, in the back of the room, someone was monitoring the questions coming from our live stream. Do we have one or two questions from our online audience? Can you hear me? Okay, great. I'm going to read this one. As Professor Katz mentioned, the Palestinian cause has been taken up as the premier issue for the activist left. And yet many of the protesters have very little actual knowledge of the history of the region. As Professor Ron Hasner's recent survey revealed in the phrase, quote, from the river to the sea, unquote, a large portion of students could not name which river or which sea, and didn't know who Yasser Arafat was, as just a few examples. They probably can't tell you when the first or second intifadas in Israel took place and the circumstances surrounding them. In light of this, why do you think Israel-Gaza has been such a central issue when it's really something most students know very little about? I mean, yeah, so I think that anti-Zionism today in certain respects mimics what David Nuremberg means when he talks about anti-Judaism in his kind of famous book on that topic. And I want to be clear, that doesn't mean I'm saying anti-Zionism uh, is the same thing as anti-Semitism. The argument that Nuremberg makes is that historically anti-Judaism in many times and places has occurred as a way to understand the world better, to make sense of challenges, and it has occurred often among people who did not know many or sometimes any actual Jews or much or anything about actual Judaism. I think that anti-Zionism being taken up to the degree that it is today by the activist left, there's a combination of factors. I mean, there, there is a humanitarian disaster going on in Gaza. Let's be just honest about that. That's a real thing, right? It, it, it's a tragedy of epic proportions. There is, for some people, an awakening to greater knowledge of the complexities of Israel-Palestine, right? We, we might not hear very complex views, but they might have sort of, you know, not known much at all, and, and they've only learned one side, maybe. They've only learned about uh, suffering of Palestinians. Um, but there's a sense of an awakening and the need to do something. Uh, but 
there is very often a kind of slippage from a very vague knowledge and an assumption there must be oppressors and there must be oppressed, and that's the way all conflicts work, uh, and so I don't need to dig very deep. Uh, and here is a way that I can signal to others and see myself that I am against imperialism, I am against oppression, I am against racism. Uh, and so it has been you know, locked onto that way uh, in a way that I do think is ultimately quite damaging because it is incredibly simplistic in a lot of the rhetoric that it produces and it is often taking the form of shutting down conversations because of tremendous moralizing, right? Uh, the, the Middle East conflict is not a morality play. We hear it being talked about like it is a morality play by many public commentators, by many politicians, and unfortunately by too many academic colleagues. And once we're there, then there's good guys, there's bad guys. It's not complicated. Just get on the side of the victims and the good guys. Um, and it could be on either side, by the way. There are people who think all the victims are the victims of October 7th. And there are people who think all the victims are the victims in Gaza. And once you're there, you've lost the capacity for analysis. You've lost the capacity for nuance. So I think that this is, in many ways, a version of that. Another online question. Sorry. For Professor Waxman, can you please expand on the propaganda war? You mentioned it's happening on both sides. I'd like to hear how it's manifesting on the Palestinian side. Well, I think, um, you know, the claim that I think in, in, any, in any war, there is the attempt of uh, the parties to try to shape the narrative, right? Um, and so on the one on the Palestinian side, uh, we the, the narrative that's being that's that we we've heard and from quite early on is that essentially Israel the uh, Israel's actions are uh, genocidal in Gaza, and that this is not a response to October the seventh. Uh, this is not uh, you know action that that the actions of the Israeli military uh, make no distinction make are, are deliberately aimed at massacring Palestinian civilians, um, depopulating the Gaza Strip ethnically cleansing Gaza. Um, and, you know, and, and so essentially that this is a war of annihilation or ethnic cleansing than, uh, than anything else. And now I should say that there's not, the, the fact that people are making these claims as in most cases, as in all cases of popular, generally there's a grain of truth that there are statements that are genuinely shocking and dehumanizing that be made by Israeli officials. So it's not like, out of thin air that people make these claims. They're looking at the, the scale of the, um, mass suffering and, the, and forced displacement and killing. Um, but the way in which, that, but it's the shaping international public opinion, right? Because the, the, uh, the, the main way in which, uh, uh, on, for Hamas, certainly, they're gonna stop this and win, because if the, if if the war is brought to a stop, they'll win, essentially, um, is, by marshalling international public opinion against Israel to put then pressure on their governments to get Israel to stop. Um, and so, you know, the way to do that is to say, this is not a, this is a campaign of, of genocide and ethnic cleansing. Um, on, the Israel, on the Israeli side, of course, there's the, the flip, the opposite narrative that, um, you know, Israel makes every effort uh, to distinguish between combatants and non-combatants, that it's the most moral army in the world, that all its actions are entirely just, that the humanitarian catastrophe is solely Hamas's fault, you know, all of these things. I mean, this is not unique to the Israel-Palestine. Uh, this is just what, part, you know, what sides do in war, especially when they are needing to, um, and some, in some ways reliant upon external powers, right? And so they're having to try to win this battle for global public opinion. Um, and so all I'm saying in, that, in, in raising that is to recognize and to be cognizant of the fact that we are the targets of this, these campaigns. And um, what we're receiving is, is, is shaped by that. That doesn't mean to say they're totally false, but they're always gonna be selective and self-serving. Um, and so I think we can clearly see that and we, and we just have to be mindful of that and not end up parroting, you know, simply uncritically these claims and not, and, and not actually thinking for ourselves and trying to look at uh, in, a, in a more critical light. Um, I'd like to take one more question from a student, an uh, undergraduate. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you both. Um, I'm wondering, were you looking at 
the, the microphone is coming to you so that the online audience can hear. Um, when you're looking at colleges as obvious hotspots of this discourse, um, I'm wondering whether you see college students or anybody on college campuses as generally following after or reflecting discourse that's going on more broadly in the nation or internationally, or if you see college campuses as being a place where um, a lot of this discourse is developing and is changing and evolving, which is then being exported out outside of college campuses? Good That's a great question. Uh, I, I mean, I think in many ways, you know, we talk about, you know, universities and colleges as the ivory tower, like as this, this, this myth that somehow, you know, campuses are removed from the concerns of the world and untouched by it. And, you know, s scholars kind of sit in tweed coat jackets, smoking pipes and, and, and you know, it's, it, that, that's, that's, not be, that's not been the case. I mean, college campuses have always been uh, sites of political activism, as I've already mentioned, uh, the Berkeley in the 1960s and, and many others. So it's not, a so in many ways, the tumult and, and turmoil that's happened on campus is a reflection of these, uh, this broader dynamic. Um, so the issue about anti-Zionism that we're discussing is, is, not is not a unique issue on college campuses. It's just on college campuses, there are, there are more anti-Zionists, number one, because there are more progressive people. I mean, the student population, and we, we can see this in, in the survey data, student population it leans left. Right? There's much more, there are many more political progressives in, on college, among students, young people today certainly, and among faculty than in the population at large. So there's going to be an over-representation, if you like, of, of progressives on campus and of anti-Zionists. Um, so in that sense, it magnifies it uh, because it's more like, and also students, not all, but some might have more time. Most people, and you know, to, to engage in activism and protest. Many people fear, uh, many people have jobs or fear the professional consequences. Unfortunately, now students have to fear those consequences as well because of doxing and, and harassment, which is really problematic. We haven't talked about that, but that is a major issue. Um, but, you know, so I think in some ways what's ha what takes place on college campuses is a microcosm or, you know, of these large, but intensified because people are, people of different political persuasions are, are living together or grouped together in the same spaces. Most, the only other place where we really see it take, is online, is in social media. Otherwise, you know, very, you know, pro-Israel, uh, people who are very pro-Israel aren't necessarily sitting in the same spaces, or at least may, they might be, but they're not discussing it. They're not exposed to others' views. That's one of the reasons why being on a college campus is such a special place, precisely because it is maybe the one time in people's lives where they really are exposed to different opinions, different perspectives, viewpoints, experiences that are very different, because most of the time in their life, they're not or if they are, they're not actually engaging in real discussions. So I don't, I think, unfortunately, one of the, one of the, one of my criticisms of the, dis, of the discussion that's taken place over the last few months about um, college campuses is that it's seen, it's, it's treated it as, as if anti-Semitism is a specific issue to college campuses. And like, this is a specific problem in higher education that's specifically been fostered by the failure of, say, these university administrations, as opposed to recognizing that anti-Semitism is a problem in general, right? Anti-Semitic tropes are uh, widely believed in, you know, that not just by hardcore anti-Semites. And, um, you know, it's, it, and so these are, these are problems that may be magnified, and they're not even, mag uh, you know, on college campuses, and I would, I would just, end by saying we should also bear in mind that we're in most cases only talking about a handful of college campuses there's a the, that the actual most college campuses are not hotbeds of student activism most students are just trying to you know pay off their uh, their, their their loans and get by and work jobs and find jobs um it's there's a the media <coughs> um, and politicians have focused on a small number of elite such as this one 
and Harvard and others, and, and given him, and you know, generally on the coasts, and focusing on these as if they're representative of higher education, when in fact there's a huge diversity. I mean, most cases, most campuses are quite politically quiescent. And, and I said, part of the reason why they're doing that, why we need to push back on this, is because there is a broader ideological agenda here. Right? It's not just about trying to, it is also about trying to strip tenure. It is about trying to defund higher education. There's a much broader political uh, agenda which has been underpinning this. And we need to, and I think, and unfortunately, one of the things, going back to maybe the first question, what has changed for me in thinking about anti-Zionism on campus is realizing this is not just an issue about Israel, Palestine and anti-Semitism. This is now being used by groups for, their, for ulterior purposes to wage a lot, to help them wage a war on higher education, which has been, and, and so what was an issue about, for me, of concern to me as a, somebody concerned with Israel-Palestine and, and being Jewish and concerned about, it, realizing that this is being exploited now and is being used as a, as a, to serve a broader purpose of stripping, in some cases, stripping tenure, defunding universities, privatizing, and the whole, you know, a, a campaign that's been happening for a long time, but is really now being given much more wind in the sails by what's been taking place on a few college campuses uh, in recent months. And I, I'm not saying it's not an issue, it is an issue, but I think we have to have it, uh, uh, pr keep it a good sense of proportion and not think that every, there's like hundreds of universities and colleges and most of them are not hotbeds of, you know, um, Palestinian activism or anti-Semitism. So, yeah, I, I'm just going to respond quickly. I mean, I, I agree with much of what Dove said, but I do think in some ways a lot of college campuses we're failing on this issue, right? And the reason I say we're failing is that we are, we have a set of activist positions uh, and a set of discourses that have in many ways been shaped by a profoundly polarized discourse on the global stage and on the national stage politically, right? Campuses are supposed to be a place where we can have conversations that are based on growing knowledge, that are based on diversity and a diversity of opinions, that are based on listening to people who we disagree with and learning from them, that are based on learning. And when our campus conversations are defined in extraordinarily polemical and polarized terms, as they have been by and large, at least visible campus conversations during this war, we can understand all the factors, um, but it, it, in some sense, it, 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 it disappoints people profoundly, and it should disappoint them profoundly in terms of the purpose of a college campus. And part of the reason is also that in this war, most people speaking on campuses who have strong feelings are leading with emotion. I cannot tell you how many people I know who are extraordinarily rational and careful thinkers in most realms of life who on this issue that kind of goes out the window and they lead with emotion uh, and for understandable reasons. But when emotion is driving the conversation, neuroscience tells us our frontal cortex is not working as well, right? So part of the job of universities is to figure out how to help people not lose their emotions, but channel their passions in a way that involves learning and listening. So in that way, conversations like this, we hope are uh, part of an effort to um, you know, bring us back toward the central mission of universities. And you asked a question about what comes in and what goes out from universities. I think what we really hope is that what goes out from universities in this moment is a call for more conversations, more thoughtful conversations, more dialogue, uh, and a breaking down of polarized and simplistic positions. That's an excellent place to pause tonight's conversation. It will continue in two weeks. And I urge you all to register to watch the live stream from UCLA as they, these two gentlemen take a deeper dive into the relationship between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And I encourage you all to listen to each other and to open your hearts and remember what's important and be kind to each other. It's a very difficult time for all of us. And thank you to the university for opening its doors and the Center for Jewish Studies for sponsoring this talk.